Today, sell while you can. The DFA Daily to the 12th of June 2020. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, World Analytics Post, covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In today's post, we'll look at the carnage on the markets and consider the implications more broadly. US stocks sold off for the third day in a row, and Thursday's losses were the sharpest. The Dow Jones Industrial Average tumbled 6.9% or 1,800 points, the biggest one-day drop in three months. Risk aversion was in full swing, with currencies falling across the board and oil dropping by its largest amount in two months. The US dollar traded sharply higher on safe haven flows, and the Australian dollar was hit the hardest, with the Canadian and New Zealand dollar trailing not far behind. Sterling also fell sharply, and surprisingly the euro was the most resilient, but it also succumbed to end-of-day losses. There wasn't one but many catalysts for the meltdown in stocks. Instead, the lack of additional stimulus from the Fed, Chairman Jerome Powell's cautiously optimistic tone, profit-taking and worries about a second wave of coronavirus cases after spikes in Texas, Arizona and California all contributed to the decline. The fear of a second wave is real. COVID cases are increasing in 21 states, with 14 seeing new highs. Florida reported its largest single-day increase in cases since the pandemic began. The same was true for Texas, which reported more than 2,500 new cases. And in Arizona, cases have risen 49% from May 26th to June 9th. That's 14 days, the incubation period, by the way, of COVID. After Memorial Day, Anyway, anyone who thinks that the US has won the battle against COVID is wrong, and in states where the curve has been flattening like New York, it still remains to be seen whether protests have shifted the trend. Powell warned yesterday that if a second wave happens locally, it could hamper the economy, so he doesn't know for sure if the labour market has bottomed. And of course, the OECD came up with the same view yesterday. Investors sought safety in the US dollar, driving the greenback higher against all of the major currencies, with the exception of other safe havens like the Japanese yen and Swiss franc. These sell-offs are consistent with the slide in stocks and treasury yields. Weekly jobless claims and the producer price index had very little impact on the greenback. PPI rose more than expected in May, but excluding the recovery in energy prices and food prices, PPI fell for the second month in a row. Jobless claims were slightly lower, with 1.5 million new benefit filings, down from 1.89 million the prior week, and from the 6.89 million peak at the end of March. The University of Michigan's Consumer Sentiment Index is scheduled, of course, for release tomorrow, and given the rally in stocks up to this week, and state reopenings, it's probable that further improvements in sentiment will be detected. But, of course, the question is for how long. Unlike other currencies that have experienced sharp declines today, the euro's losses are more moderate in comparison. But it's hard to pinpoint the specific catalyst for that situation. It could be the continued reopenings, the relaxation of travel bans, or the lack of meaningful upticks in new infections in Europe as restrictions ease. Eurozone industrial production is due for release, and a deeper decline is expected. And we continue to look for a correction in the euro US dollar, especially if stocks continue to fall as the move becomes overstretched. The Australian and New Zealand dollars were hit the hardest by risk aversion. Unlike the US, both countries have effectively flattened the curve. Only nine cases or so were reported in Australia yesterday, while New Zealand has only had seven cases in the last month and zero in the past week. But yet these currencies are extremely sensitive to the market's tolerance for risk, particularly after strong moves in May and June. Tensions between China and Australia are heating up, with China telling Australia to take a hard look at their current problems. China is punishing Australia for questioning Beijing for allowing the spread of COVID-19 in the first place. It instituted tariffs on barley and put an almost 38 billion Aussie dollar education revenue stream at risk. 
and the Canadian dollar also fell sharply on the back of sharp declines in crude oil prices. And the US dollar Canadian dollar broke above 1.35, enjoying its strongest rally in more than a month. Sterling is in focus with UK GDP, industrial production, and the trade balance scheduled for release. And considering that these are April data points, when manufacturing PMI hit a record low, the risk is to the downside for these reports. And the ASX 200 also closed lower, down more than 2%, while the finance sector index fell even further. The local volatility index spiked higher, and the Aussie dollar slipped back to around 68 cents. Credit Suisse's Damon Boy said that loan approvals fell sharply by 9.2% in April, taking year-end growth lower to minus 2.9% from 12.6%. Compositionally, weaknesses were broad-based across lending categories, with particularly sharp falls in personal and business construction loans. Worse still, the Australian Bureau of Statistics believes that loan application backlogs from March spilled over into April, making the April data look a lot better than it actually was. Clearly, the shutdowns and related tightening of credit conditions have had negative effects on credit creation. Weakness in loan demand foreshadowed by tighter credit conditions does not surprise because lending indicators have foreshadowed this outcome for some time. Their proprietary credit conditions index is based on banks' willingness to lend on interest-only terms, the bank's willingness to lend to high loan-to-value ratios, and the inverted credit spreads as a proxy for the easiness of corporate lending conditions. And the index leads loan approvals expressed as a share of credit by several quarters. And over the past few months, the CCI has headed lower on the back of tightening corporate credit conditions and stagnant mortgage lending standards. Only very recently has it started to recover on the back of central bank quantitative easing, causing credit spreads to narrow. But overall, the CCI has evolved in such a way that it has pointed to loan demand weakening further before stabilising, and the loan approvals data has indeed been following this forecast trajectory. Bank credit growth is likely to slow. Historically, the cycle in loan approvals leads the cycle in credit growth because movement in flows tend to lead movement in the stock. And now that loan approvals are falling, it's only a matter of time before the back book of loans catches down too. Indeed, credit growth is already slowing sharply in monthly sequential terms as drawdowns on credit lines peak and true weakness in marginal loan demand starts to surface. And there's more evidence of housing investor deleveraging, which is offsetting owner-occupied repayment holidays. New loans are not the only driver of credit growth. Repayment activity matters a lot too. By definition, credit growth should equal new loans written net of refinancing activity and repayments. Applying this definition to housing credit, they note that overall net principal repayments are little changed from previous month, but the lack of change marks some very divergent trends among the components. Owner-occupied net repayments are declining reflecting applications for debt repayment holidays from the banks. But investor net repayments are increasing, reflecting the desire for leveraged risk parity investors to de-risk and de-lever now that they are being wrong-footed on the rising risk profile of housing. Indeed, the evidence is that the deleveraging behaviour of investors is overshadowing the non-repayment activity of owner occupiers, or in other words, Housing credit growth is slowing despite the best of efforts from policymakers and banks to reflate the stock of credit through non-repayments and deferrals. Overall, the credit impulse could definitely slow sharply and they're concerned that by the time they see bank credit growth slowing in earnest, Fiscal policymakers will already be thinking about pairing back stimulus. There is a material risk that the economy's overall credit impulse will fade quite rapidly in the second half, weighing on the domestic recovery. Wages fell by 0.7% in the year to June, according to the Melbourne Institute's latest monthly survey of workers. And it's the first time there has been negative growth in pay since the early 2000s, with the series also hitting a record low. 
Sam Tauslis of the Melbourne Institute notes that wages growth has been subdued for some years and the economic impact of the pandemic is likely to put more downward pressure on wages. A negative pay growth number on its own is very unusual and a large negative number is unique, he told the Australian. The survey only includes those with jobs but would reflect a drop in hours as employers struggled through the pandemic. And he said workers have experienced very little growth in wages for years and that there were no obvious catalysts on the horizon that could break this strand. If anything, the negative economic shocks will cause further downward pressure on wages growth, even if the economy does recover. And Damien Classen from Nucleus Wealth penned a thoughtful piece today saying stock markets have dislocated from fundamentals. The economic fundamentals are almost as bad as they've ever been. Stock market valuations are almost as expensive as they've ever been. But that hasn't concerned markets for the past six weeks. And to be frank, he says, it doesn't look like concerning markets anytime soon. This is presenting you with a rare second chance, he says, to sell stocks in the face of the worst economic shock of our lifetime. For complete disclosure, he says, there is another alternative. That alternative is that markets are now entirely dependent on central bank support. So economics and fundamentals no longer matter. And this is certainly possible. And it's also an ironic logical progression. Capitalism is dead, therefore buy stocks. The markets have risen for three reasons, he says. Central banks, money printing, leaving more money in markets. Momentum traders, robots and retail traders chasing the bounce higher. And inequality getting worse with rich people more likely to keep their jobs. And so they're investing more because there are limited opportunities to consume. Now this is all despite the weak corporate profits. The question is, of course, whether weak profits will eventually bring this back to reality. It is possible stock markets will ignore earnings for three to five years until profits recover, but he says, I think it's unlikely. The stock markets will eventually recover argument is a favourite argument of the perma bulls. The underlying logic of this argument is nothing bad ever matters because stock prices will eventually recover. The logic is mostly true. But he says, last time I checked, the ASX was still below 2007 levels. 13 years is a long time for prices to go nowhere if you go all in at the wrong time. I'm assuming you're still reading because you don't want to wait for that long, he says. And he argues that his best guess is a mix of bankruptcies and weak earnings will eventually do it. It might take six months, it might take six minutes, he says. A Biden win in the US has the potential to shock the market with higher taxes and wages, and he expects this will actually be good for profits in the long term, but it might be enough to shock the market back to reality in the short term. The danger for investors who have a plan to run with the herd and then sell when the market turns is that there seems to be a lot of other investors with a similar strategy, and given markets have set records for the speed of both downward and upward movements, you will want to be very confident of your ability to get out at the right time, he said. And what about central bank support? Well, the arguments are that central bank liquidity will overwhelm insolvency risks, that government stimulus overwhelms the economic damage. And it's not a particularly nuanced argument, he says, central banks will buy or fund everything and he says, if his defensive position is wrong, this is probably going to be why. Dig a little deeper. And the argument, though, is less convincing. Governments and central banks have a choice. Take more pain earlier and recover faster or delay the pain and have a much more drawn out recovery. And governments and central banks seem to be opting for the second. Which means investors are going to have a lot longer to wait for company profits to recover. And the question is, can central banks and governments prop up failing large companies? Well, they can and probably will. 
There is a slight question about for how long. However, the reaction to pretty much every debt crisis since Japan in the 1990s has been to prop up zombie companies. And he thinks the plan is that if you give these companies enough low interest debt, then you can see out your term and leave any problems to your successors. So he expects zombie companies to proliferate. Companies with such enormous debt burdens and low profits that they have little hope of ever paying off the debt, which means the recovery will take longer. And then he asks, can central banks and governments prop up failing small and medium businesses? These companies make up somewhere between 50 and 70% of most economies. They don't have listed debt that central banks can buy. And it's extremely hard to prop up small businesses. The fraud risks are too high. Take a loan, transfer your assets into your wife's name, pay your brother-in-law for some fit-out, declare bankruptcy. The Australian government did indeed try to support small and medium businesses by offering partial loan guarantees for up to $40 billion of bank lending. The actual amount of credit looks like it would be closer to $4 billion, i.e. 90% lower than was announced, and it's hard to support this part of the economy. And he's yet to see any proposal which looks workable. And then the next question is, can central banks and governments continue to pay people not to work? And the answer, of course, is yes. The question is, for how long? Many governments put in place short-term measures to support earnings for displaced workers. Most plans tail off over the next six months. And in most developed countries, the virus is now contained enough that hospitals are not overrun, which means economies are at the stage where the imperative will become finding people new jobs rather than paying them not to do their old jobs. Will we see governments continue to pay elevated unemployment benefits to displaced workers for years, he asks? Well, possibly, but this once again will delay any recovery. And so he concludes, the numbers are messed up at the moment. Growth rates are so large in both directions that they are virtually meaningless. The focus for investors, therefore, should be on where earnings can get back to over the next few years. And I'm struggling, he says, to find anyone with a credible earnings scenario that would justify paying current prices. So he's betting central banks and governments won't suspend capitalism forever and there were a lot of superannuation funds and investors who completely missed the virus coming and rode the stock market all the way down and then most of the way back. So they've been gifted, he said, a second opportunity to sell. But his thought is that very few will take the opportunity. And I think that's the key point. If you think that we're going to get a quick bounce back, then you may go one track. But if the reality is that this is going to take years to work through and that we're going to see continued pressure on economies both locally and globally, then the stock markets are completely off the wall and will fall and fall significantly. So I think it's probably good advice from Damien. Consider selling before it's too late. Not, of course, that we give financial advice on this channel. And by the way, I should just mention that Damien will be coming on to our Tuesday live stream events, the one, in fact, on the 30th of June. So you can ask him questions direct then. And just before I go, I should also remind you that next Tuesday, on the 16th of June at 8 p.m. Sydney time, I'll be running my next live stream. Where we'll be updating our finance and property scenarios. And you can ask a question live there, too or send a question in beforehand via the DFA blog. The links are in the comments below. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again in the next video.